session. Our speaker is Ming Wu from UC Berkeley, and we'll talk about low rank approximation. Thank you very much, Yosa, and uh, thanks to the uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. So I'm going to talk about low rank approximations, both some theory and uh, algorithms. This is uh, what we've been doing uh, over the last few years. And most of the people here, they are uh, graduate students. Some of them are still here. Some of them have graduated. So uh, Dave Anderson, he's at Google now. Uh, Jay Josh, he's at the same year. Uh, Eric Holman, he's still here. He should graduate next year. Uh, Bao Li is also here. Uh, Jin Wei Shao, he's actually going to Facebook. Uh, so is Chao Chu Yuan. Uh, content. So this was supposed to be an hour talk, so I'm going to squeeze a lot of stuff and I'm going to skip a lot of material as well. And Yosu already threatened me to cut me off if I go over 30 minutes. So I will fo mostly focus on the theory part of this. And we're going to talk about what's called the spectrum revealing QR factorizations. Traditionally, there's something called a rank revealing QR factorization. We're going to review that and see what the difference is. And we can generalize this idea to most of those matrix factorizations get, and get similar results. And we're also going to look at the block Lanchos algorithm. This is all for low rank approximations. And there's a number of different methods that have been developed for these factorizations. And I'm going to, if I have time, focus on this Q1 part of this. And I'm going to skip the rest of these things. So. Over the past, uh, past few years, we have been submitting these papers. And we got uh, so far five acceptances at these top machine learning conferences. And typically, the acceptance rate is less than uh, 20%. And one of the papers was uh, received this best paper award. This was like uh, in 2017, I think, yes. <clears throat> OK, so what is going on? Um, so we're trying to come up with, you know, for any given factorization, we try to get the best possible bounds. And uh, we try to find methods that can compute these factorizations efficiently. And uh, beyond low rank, as like Mike Mahoney would say, sometimes you can preserve sparsity or structure or maybe like uh, maybe the column or in rows of the matrices to get the, something beyond the SVD. I will not get into the details, but we will talk about some of these uh, results if we have the time. Okay, so this is the traditional way to look at the rank reviewing factorizations. So what you have is you're looking at a QR factorization. So here, uh, the Q would be orthogonal, and this is going to be the R part of the matrix. Pi is a permutation. So what you're doing is you're reshuffling the columns of a matrix M, and after that, you get a QR factorization. This can be a partial factorization up to this L. So traditionally, what we wanted to do was to figure out uh, the numerical rank of a matrix so that it can do, for example, these squares correctly. And uh, the focus is in finding the rank. So uh, in this setup, what you can show is that you can find a permutation pi so that the leading piece, the AL matrix, will have all its singular values, 1 to L. Uh, the j would, <coughs> sigma j would be the j largest single value. So all these single values will match the original single values up to a constant factor. Okay, so if you, uh, uh, let's say the j single value is tiny in the original matrix, this one would also be tiny. That would indicate rank deficiency. So that was the idea. So nowadays people do data analysis. And what you want is a low rank approximation and not a rank determination. So this by itself does not tell you how you get a low rank approximation or get it reliably. So that is the difference. <clears throat> so what we do is to look at it slightly differently. It's still the same factorization. Again, this pi is the quantum <coughs> permutation. You do a partial QR factorization. But what we're going to look at is not the matrix AL, rather it's going to be AL, BL. You're going to throw away the CL part of the matrix. And now you do analysis. 
So if we define this tau j to be a ratio of these single values, the L here is going to be the dimension of this L matrix, and the J would be the same index as the leading kind of, uh, it's the index of this leading single value. You take the ratio of this, what you would expect. Markers. Yeah, markers. There, Thank you. So for example, typically you're looking at a data matrix, the single values would decay like this. Okay, so there's no particular gap in the spectrum, but uh, single values typically decay. So if you look for low rank, let's say rank K approximation, your K probably would be here, and your L would be somewhere here. Your G would be somewhere like this. Yes? A L not yet R L. Is that A L not up a triangular? A L would be. So the. Oh, so why is that not R L? <laughs> so we typically like this. Why, what? I'm saying why not call it a capital R? So yeah, uh, yeah, maybe that would be a better notation, yeah. In the paper, it's in your paper, original paper, it's A, right? Yeah, we just didn't change the notation, sorry. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, we are looking at this tau J ratio, which is going to be sigma L plus 1 over sigma J. And you see that if you have a gap in between K and L, then you would expect this ratio to be reasonably small. It's not zero, but uh, hopefully it's uh, reasonably small. So that's why we actually uh, <coughs> we'll get to that. We, we, uh, we hope that if this is small, then we can hope for this to be re uh, reasonably sm small as well. So if you're looking at this A or B or part of the matrix, then this matrix, not this one, but this one, will have single values, leading single values that are a close match to the original single values up to this factor. Typically, you would expect this to be uh, small. Not always, but typically that's the case. And if you want to do a low rank, rank K approximation, then the area bound would be bounded below and above by uh, these things. And uh, the, the, only, the only thing extra would be this. Again, this is a tall dependent constant, so you have k plus 1, the k is the rank. So if you have a case where you single values decay quickly, then even the total k plus 1 could be very small. In that case, you would get a very good approximation, despite the fact that you're only doing QR factorization. OK, this is different than the previous result in that uh, here you only have a constant factor. right? This is a constant, demand dependent constant. You only get a fraction. But here, you could expect to get a very accurate approximation. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ming, could you, could you give the intuition for why you keep the B around? Because your low rank approximation is going to be linear combinations of the first L columns of Q, right? Yeah. So and what does the B help you? You already get that by having A there. If you only look at A, right, that's only just the A, that's only L columns of matrix. The B actually represents the linear combination of the remaining columns in terms of the leading columns. Oh, I see. Sorry. OK, so this typically is good. I use this, I quoted this word well, because sometimes it's not that good. OK, so if you want to do more than tau squared, you could get into tau to the fourth by doing the Stewart type approximation. So what is this? So you have m pi equals q. That's, this is the typical uh, QY factorization. But if you do an LP factorization of this, this is up triangle. You flipped to lower triangle. If you do that, then 
you throw away this piece, the trading piece, you get an even better approximation. Instead of the tall to the two, now it's tall to the four. Okay. And you would ask, you know, this would cost much, right? In fact, it doesn't cost very much. We're going to see some, uh, well, hopefully we'll see some numbers. What, could you say what P is? What the P is, P, this is just the, you're doing an LP factorizing of this matrix. It's like the Q of the transpose of this matrix. The P would be an orthogonal matrix. Here's my call. You're missing some transposes there. How did B and C get under A there? Oh, so I, will, you, I was using the older note here, but this is a different thing. This is a lower triangular matrix, not upper triangular. Not the same. Yeah, not the same. Okay, typically you would do much better with this. Okay, so an example to see all the differences. Here you have, have your tower. This is going to be 600 by 600 matrix. And if you do truncated Q wall with 60 steps without any column shuffling, this is what you get. You know, you lose the whole picture. If you do, uh, truncated QR with the column pivoting with 60 steps, you get something like this. There's some smearing of the clouds, <coughs> but you get something. Okay, so typically if you do QR with the column pivoting, it's a very slow operation. But if you do a randomized QR with the column pivoting, you will get a, a result that's as good numerically, but it will be at a fraction of the original speed. And as you can see, this randomized version looks just like this one. But still, you see some smearing. If you do a truncated SVD, this would be, again, rank 60. And you can see that this picture looks very close to the original picture. You do lose something, but it looks, to the eye, the difference is very small. If you do what we call flip-flop, you know, you do the QR and then you do the LQ. <coughs> This thing looks almost the same as this. Difference is tiny. You, you probably don't see the difference with the eye. OK, so we've done a lot of different factorizations here. This is just a summary of what we have done so far. And it turns out that for all the major matrix factorizations, you can do the spectrum revealing version of it. And I'm going to skip all the details, but you can compute these factorizations efficiently as well. Um, so typically we have the LU factorization, we have the Chorisky factorization, we have the QR factorization. And the CUR and the CX, these are the uh, inventions of these uh, similar organizers. But uh, all of these, you can get these bounds. The only difference is in this tall value, I get to in a minute. So if you do QR, this tall value is two. If you do this flip-flop QR, this value of tau is a four. But if you do L or Chorisky, it's one, so it's much less accurate. If you do CX or CUR, they're just as accurate as QR. Okay, I probably missed a little bit of context on the, on the image factorization you did on the previous yeah. slide. Uh, is this, uh, are you storing the, is your matrix just every cop, is, your, is every entry of your matrix just the one pixel of the image, or? Yeah, the grayscale. Yeah, well, it's the grayscale so of the image. Your, your uh, rows are literally the rows of your image, your column yeah. are literally the column yeah. of your image. Yeah. For these, for these types of spectrum revealing factorizations, like, are your pivoting rules the same as they are for the ranking <coughs> rooms you are, or using different pivoting rules? It, uh, for example, for the LU, right? It's basically like a LU with the column pivoting. I mean, with complete pivoting. But we have a way to compute this quickly. Okay. Typically, you don't do this, right? It's supposed to be slow. But it, if you do randomization, you can do this very quickly. And the same thing with the Cholesky. <coughs> or even with the CURCX factorizations, you have a way to pick the column pivots very quickly. Yes? Yes, sir. Flip flop QR, does that correspond to one step of the Francis QR algorithm for computing eigenvalues? It's basically, you can think of this as like a subsequent iteration on the whole matrix. It's also the uh, Stewart's method. Stewart's called it a 
P O Q or something. Q L Q L P. Yes, that's the uh, Stuart Q L P algorithm. Yeah, but he does it very slowly. We do it very quickly. So for the Cholesky, do you mean that it is only applicable to the case when M is a real symmetric or Hermitian? Oh yes, of course. Okay, and uh, you have a only rho equals to one. Okay, yeah. Thanks. No, 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 for Cholesky, it would be diagonal pivoting. Oh. Is there any way to improve the performance of Cholesky to have a higher order? Uh, uh, the question is, can you do this better than this, right? Yeah, yeah. You can. You know, um, if you really want to work through it, you know, there's better ways to do it. Yeah. So those are based on matrix factorizations. As you, can, as you saw, the best you could do was for a uh, tall value of 4. So most of the time, this is good, but sometimes you think this is not enough. You want to do better than that. If you really want to get a high quality lowering approximation, you got to do block line chops or block bilateralization, block bilateralization. And this is the math for it. You know, you're given this V1 matrix, initial matrix, with B columns, and you just do this bidiagonalization, standard thing. Okay, so the details don't matter for us at this point. So uh, if you want if you kind of come with a mathematical equivalent, but uh, like easier to understand version of this, this is what it is. You're basically calculating the uh, orthogonal space, orthogonal basis of this subspace, columns of uh, this matrix K. You don't, calcu you don't calculate it this way, but math mathematically, this is what it is. You get the basis for this matrix, and then you do uh, truncated SVD. Um, so there's a few things to be said. The B is the <coughs> number of columns in your omega, which is the initial matrix. And uh, you're looking for a rank K approximation. So B times Q, Q is the number of steps. That needs to be bigger than K. That's the only thing that you require for this to work in theory. Um, so I'm going to just uh, put the result right here. It looks very messy. So what we're looking at is um, maybe the projection, the BK, out of the block Lanchos algorithm, even though Lanchos really did not do this work in particular. Um, so you're looking for a rank K approximation. You've done Q steps. So there's a lot of parameters floating around. Um, but uh, the Q is the number of steps. B is the block size. K is the rank you're looking for. Here we introduce another thing called R. This R has nothing to do with the algorithm. It's only part of our analysis. So you're looking at the jth single value of this matrix. Then you can show that uh, you get at least some kind of fraction of the true jth single value. And the fraction is going to be 1 plus, of course, something, which hopefully will become 0 in the end. The C is a constant. That's a messy, messy constant. We're going to ignore the details. But uh, what's important is that the way this structured, the C does not depend on P or the Q. And uh, this part of it is the chapter polynomial. So, so the convergence depends on this weird, weird thing. Um, you can know the details, but the point of chapter polynomial is that once this thing, this argument is beyond one here, then the chapter polynomial, polynomial shoots to infinity very quickly. So as long as this is bigger than zero, you hope that when you increase p, this whole thing becomes zero quickly. Yes? So where is omega in this formula? Where is what? Omega. Your omega is part of the C. That's the initial matrix. What is capital T? Hmm? T. Cap capital T. Capital T, that's the chapter polynomial. OK, so the thing is very messy. You know, it's, very hard to, it's very hard for the eye to digest in a few seconds. But this R here, which is part, not part of the algorithm, it's some artificial primary that we introduce. And uh, this is what it is. So the question is, what do you do with this? 
OK, before we see what we do with this, let's just do comparison with what people have found so far. So uh, Saad was the one who started block line shows. This was in the 80s. He had a bond like this. This lambda could be thought of as sigma squared. And uh, Moscow, this is like a three years ago, uh, they had a, a very interesting paper that was for gap independent lower bound. In the form that we're looking at, probably it's something like this. There's some constants, and then you have q negative 2, and the q is the number of iterations. So essentially, the idea is that uh, you would eventually get convergence independent of the gap. No matter what back gap is, you know, uh, no matter what happens to this curve, you will get convergence. But numerically, this does not give you very much because your q never exceeds n. So all it says is that you get a fraction. And uh, you could introduce the gaps, but uh, uh, that would be kind of similar to what uh, we would see if in the traditional bound. So our bound is very messy. And uh, it has this artificial prime, the r in it. The r goes into the degree of the Chapier polynomial, but also into the argument. So the bigger the r, the smaller the degree, uh, the bigger the argument. So this is a balance. Yes. Do you need the gap here? Yeah. So, gap. Sigma, so VR, that's what it controls, right? The gap. But why do you need the gap? It's just a lower approximation. There's no gap. So can this be zero? Uh, so, so here, the, <clears throat> what you know is that when you increase r, this ratio, right, this guy is bigger than this guy. So what happens if they're equal? What happens if all the train signal values are equal? That's what happens if they're all equal, right? Um, for this argument, we're going to ignore the case that they are all the same. So because if, if they're all the same, you have to you know, ignore some of those things. Your method will not recover those. Yeah, you know, the multiplicity has to be smaller than the block size. OK, here's the punchline. It turns out that uh, if you play with the R value correctly, you can show that the bond we showed implies superlinear convergence. So that is, if you pretend that your measure has infinite dimensions, you know, sigma is converged to 0, then you have this thing. What's this thing? So you can see it from this plot. You're looking at the convergence of the uh, 200th single value. Okay. And this is with uh, randomized subset iteration, which is known to be a linear convergent method. And uh, this is block line shows with different block sizes. And uh, the uh, vertical and horizontal axis is the number of matrix, the number of matrix vector multiplies. That's the work that you have done for doing, for computing the uh, single values. As you can see, that uh, these all show superlinear convergence behavior. The bigger the block size, the slower the convergence, but still they are superlinear convergent. OK, so how much time do I have? Um, five minutes. Five minutes. OK, so I'm going to jump into the uh, algorithm part. I only have five minutes, so I get to show you a few plots. We're going to skip these. Uh, can we just do this? So this is distributed memory uh, implementation of the spectrum revealing QR. Um, so what you see here is a 20,000 by 20,000 matrix. And here we take the rank to be 20,000 as well. Um, so the layout is that we have, I think, the same, uh, the same number of rows. Uh, how do I say? It's a square layout. Like uh, the uh, PR is the number of um, processes, and the PC is the number of processes as well. So they, uh, you have a two, uh, square layout of the processes. And uh, the block size is 64. The P is 10. That's some, like, uh, you can think of this as some kind of L related parameter in this calculation. Um, 
so the this is the runtime plot. Okay. So we have looked at a number of different implementations. So the there's the LPAC implementation, a um, scalar pack implementation, and also a scalar pack maybe future scalar pack implementation or something. It's supposed to be faster than the QR with the column pivoting. And uh, this is our implementation somewhere. There's also the QR without column pivoting. That's as that's the uh, baseline comparison. So the this is our algorithm. This is a QR without any column pivoting. And uh, these are some other scalar pipe implementations with column pivoting. You can see that uh, we have a huge speed up over these things. And uh, this is the strong scaling of, uh, of, this, of these algorithms. They don't scale very well. That's because for the size 20,000 by 20,000, by the time you have a lot of processes, each process has very little work to do. So that's why there's no uh, good, strong scaling. But the big thing is that uh, when you start, we are much faster than the other methods. And this is the same thing as before, except that the demand is much bigger. This is 50,000 instead of 20,000. You see uh, the same kind of behavior. Are those random matrices? These are random matrices, yes. Gaussian random matrices? Um, Uniform random? Maybe, because here we're just going through all the way to the end, so it makes little difference. Uh, this is CX and the CUR. This is CUR, this is CX. So here, what we're looking at is quality versus time. Quality means the ratio between the computed JS thinking values versus the original JS thinking value. So if your ratio is one, that means you have captured the thinking value correctly. If it's less than one, if it's much less than one, you have not captured it correctly. So this is our method somewhere here against a random method, random permutation, and uh, some other competing methods. So as you can see that if you don't pivot correctly, you don't get much. But for us, if we pivot correctly, as you increase the rank, your ratios become very close to one. But not one, which means that this is not really if you are looking for high accuracy approximation, this is not very good. Runtime. Um, this is QR with kind of random pivoting. This is our method. These are the competing methods. We are a factor of 10 or better than the other methods. Um, that's the CUR. This is CX. Uh, it's kind of the same kind of behavior. This is random column permutation. This is our method somewhere. And these are the competing methods. So the, for the competing methods and our method, the qualities are compatible. But our method is here as far as runtime goes. It's, again, maybe a factor of 10 or more. Better. Thank you very much. Are there questions for me? Like, do you have a sense of like, it, like your your down depends very much on the block size in this sort of like complicated way? Do you have a sense of like how you should fix choose the block size? Should you just like try a bunch of different ones and see which converges faster, or like? You're like you talking about this one? B versus Q. Like you have B and Q, and yeah, you have like. Talking about this size. one? Yeah. Okay, so I know the R doesn't factor in the implementation, but the B would be in the implementation. Okay. So as far as convergence goes, the smaller the block size, the better, right? So this is b equals 1, this is 2, this is, uh, I think, 4, and so on and so forth. So as far as convergence speed goes, smaller block size is better. But on the other hand, performance depends on bigger block size. So this plot by itself does not tell you which b value is better. But our experiment seems to suggest that B equals 1 is better. Because B equals 1 allows much easier 
handling of deflation or that kind of stuff. If your B is bigger than one. So it's, it, but it might not be the right choice because it's like slower because you don't get the deeds from multiplying by one. That's right. But then there's a lot of other issues that will become so much simpler when B is one. Other question? Yes. Uh, I was wondering about the sort of any intuition behind going from tau to the two to tau to the four and sort of uh, whether they're missing like a uniqueness uh, thing here or uh, it is possible to sort of to iterate more and so this is the slide you're talking about, right? Uh, or or one before maybe like a, okay yeah so uh, this is where the value is so it's actually I use the rule value here. Um, if you do LU, right, like, I mean, it's so simple, you probably should expect to lose a lot of accuracy. Uh, but the problem for LU, the only reason you do it is because your L and U probably would be sparse. My question is about flip flop QR. So you get yes. QR, you get tau to the two, then you do another sort of LP and you get tau to the four. And I'm you, wondering maybe I'm missing a uniqueness condition, a sort of a property here, but uh, is it possible that you do a QR again and get tau to the six or something like that? It's just like intuition. So I don't know what you mean by uniqueness, because by the time you're doing this, you're just doing an approximation, right? So uh, the, by the time you do this, then this, the column permitting itself is not going to be very important. So you can continue doing this, but this amounts to subspace iteration, which I already said in this plot. So if you're really into convergence, if you want to have higher accuracy, you do block line choice. I think let's defer any remaining questions to lunch. Let's thank Ming again. Also, congratulate him on his best paper. Thank you.